Um, I'm not going to get up there because, frankly, I don't have the authority. Uh, I, I don't have, you look at my resume, haven't been in think tanks, haven't sat with policymakers, except when fighting for the Textile Association, National Textile Association. Um, and I know what you folks are talking about because I've read it. That's how I know it. Here's what I do know. I do know that I spent four plus decades on factory floors in my own plant, in other plants. I do know that the only things that actually matter in a business are customers and employees. That's all that matters. Everything else is real estate, intellectual property. It's all fungible. But customers and workers, they're the only things that matter. The rest of it is garbage. Um, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. Everything else is the small stuff. So, I do know that. I have boots on the ground manufacturing experience. I've dealt with cost increases, and tax increases, and economic cycles of boom and bust. I've dealt with all that. Answer to one question has been raised today, taxes. In my 30 years, um, my company and my competitors never, never made a decision based on taxes. They made decisions incorporating what the tax structure is, because we can't change it. Sitting in Valdez, North Carolina, you'll see these bags here, woven of fabric, made of yarn, grown, spun, dyed, and processed in the United States, and woven by one of my competitors in Valdez, North Carolina. And Mike Shelton told me I, I can, other people can take him. He'll find one for me. He thinks his wife uses one for gardening and he'll take it from her. Um, and I have actually sat as close as, well, closer than, than the closest of you are now with a group of employees and told them they were being downsized face to face because my job as the owner of a company is to talk to my greatest asset face to face. Don't run and hide behind some third party who's going to say to them, I got to let you go. It's my job. I'm letting them go. And they should hear it from me. It's my responsibility. I fought against the incredible stupidity and venality of banks, which took billions of taxpayer dollars in bailouts and then kept it rather than lending it to the people who needed it. I, I, I lost that fight. I really did. I saw my business killed by the stupidity of a bank. Just, they just didn't like what they saw. Hadn't lost a penny on us. Just didn't like what it looked like. What did they know? They knew nothing. Nothing. And over the years, I've learned that bankers are, and no offense, well, maybe probably is some offense, to, the, to any bankers in the room, but bankers, generally line bankers, are really stupid. Because they're asked to look at all different kinds of fields and areas and, and understand them. And that means that they look at all kinds of things and they understand none of them, not any of them. And then they make decisions based on their lack of knowledge. You know, I've, I've spoken to the remaining weavers. And I understand their strategies and concerns. And I'm here today, really, to tell you what actually works on the manufacturing floor of a private company. Most of the textile manufacturers are private companies. The ones that were public, bye-bye. Because there is no commodity business in the United States anymore. That business is long gone. The textile industry was the poster boy for giving away manufacturing. Long before, when Dick Nixon stepped off that plane in China, we could feel our necks being, the noose being tightened around our necks. From that point forward, even before that, as you and I, when we spoke on the phone, even before that, it was Japan. The, the, tex, the necktie business, fabric, te, uh, textile business, went to Korea in the mid 70s. My father fought that, testified in front of various committees to, to talk about that problem. And so we have been, we have been essentially raped as the first to go because every country has a textile industry. Right now, every country has some sort of textile industry. 
They have to. So they all have a textile industry. So what's the easiest thing to give them when they want something? Hey, give them the damn textile industry. Nobody will miss it. Except we have the Berry Amendment that says anything used by the military and now the TSA, you know those nice blue shirts? Those are made in the United States because the Berry Amendment says that horse has to be made here in the United States. And every time the Berry Amendment comes up for renewal, there's a group in Congress that says, you know, we can get it for less if we bought it in China. Yeah, but what are your soldiers going to wear when the Chinese get pissed off at you? You're going to have a whole bunch of naked soldiers running around the field. I mean, it's, it's, that's what it's all about. So what happens is we have to buy, the country has to buy textile and apparel products made in the United States of America. But then, by killing the textile industry, all the support industries that supply the textile industry, this entire supply chain, is demolished. So now those companies have to keep alive companies to make the yarns necessary. Because the only thing those companies can, can do is sell to companies making military and government textiles. There's no other customer in the United States. There's just a handful of us. And we don't use enough. When Burlington Industries was in the upholstery business, right, they were in my part of the business, which is jack art. That's where the pattern is actually woven into the fabric. That part of the business made up 1% of the overall textile industry in the United States. Of that 1%, Burlington had 72% of the looms. Burlington got out of the business in the mid 70s. Bye bye yarn guys, so long yarn dyers, so long independent fabric finishers. What we have to look at is what can you do on the floor of a factory? And we're here to talk about solutions. Let me give you the good news. These companies, unfortunately not mine, but my competitors who are really terrific people, who work hard, who I've learned to respect and come to know through trade associations. And I, if you're here with an industry, well, most of you are probably the people who represent industry trade associations. But those, com those industries that do not have trade associations, here's one of the truths that I've learned. I have always had more in common with my competitors than with any other single group of companies. They were the most important. We could, we had the same equipment problems, we had similar sourcing issues. There were a whole bunch of things we couldn't talk about in a trade association, and that's okay. But we got to know each other. We didn't sue each other over intellectual property. Not like the Chinese, where there's nobody to sue. They take your patterns, your intellectual property is not Microsoft's program. It's the photographer who does wedding and bar mitzvah pictures, whose pictures at a particularly well-known wedding or bar mitzvah is picked up in the newspaper and it says copyright Joe Schmo on the bottom, but Joe Schmo's photo somehow gets circulated around the world with him getting none of the financial reward for the sale of those businesses. It's the textile design on those Valdez bags, which is knocked off in China, doesn't enter the United States. They don't sell it to the United States because they know the importer will be sued for copyright infringement. They sell it everywhere else in the world, making the, the, uh, the product in the United States worthless. So intellectual, that's what intellectual property is. It's a thousand little wounds. You hear about the one huge wound, but a thousand little wounds inflicted on small and mid-sized manufacturers every single day. And intellectual property is one of the things that concerns people. But the good news is, We've learned some, some things that make us good. R&D, we are very good at that. We have always led the world's textile industries in, in R&D. Our design, our use of raw materials, excellent. The key there we've learned is you always keep the footsteps behind you. They're always there, but you gotta keep them behind you. That's one of the things the textile industry has learned which serves us well. Specialize. Don't try to be all things to all people. Specialize. Find a niche. 
and go in it. If it's a small niche, believe me, the guy in China whose first words to you are, so how many containers a week can we ship you? is not interested in the 400 yards of fabric you sell to restore the San Francisco Opera House. They just don't care. That's not for them. Avoid hubris. Don't think you're better than you are. See where you are, be realistic in your expectations. Don't live on past successes. I don't care what you did before. I don't care if 30% of all the furniture made in the United States was covered in your fabric today. That's the past, that'll never come back. You cannot reshore textile manufacturing. You can insource it, but you can't reshore it. And I have taken your website and said to my NTA members, look at this, what do you think? And some of them have come back and said, astounding. It's just astounding. Our customers are not really getting any advantage when they import things. Forget commodity products. But some of our manufacturers were in that commodity business and they need to have some of that volume. So what they've done is they've created hybrids. And the hybrid is product that we cannot make competitively here. We will design, we will copyright, and we will outsource that. It's never gonna get made here again. Nobody will ever make it. So do that. So those are really the key things that happen on the factory floor. What do we need from the folks in Washington? You have to know what you're doing. You have to have a trade association or somebody who knows what's going on in Washington. Because all the people sitting in this room, you guys are all really, and ladies, are all really knowledgeable. You really know what's going on. But let me assure you, the guy making kitchen cabinets back in, in your state where you, come, where you came from originally, they have not a clue. They don't know where that ax is gonna fall. They don't know what's, what's coming at them, and they, but they do need to know. We need Washington to do something about real intellectual property protection because we, it, it doesn't exist today. We need regulation that works and is commercially viable. The Consumer Product Safety Commission back in the 70s, which is how I got involved in the trade association business, was looking to do something about furniture flammability. And they wanted to make fabrics that would protect homes in case of furniture fires. So I sat with a number of different chairs of CPSC and said to them, so let me see if I get this straight. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Let me see if I get it straight. There's a fire. And at the end of the fire, the house is gone. There's nothing there but this immaculate sofa, which has not a single burn on it. That's what you're looking for? Really? How is that even viable? And we have fought this battle through the Reagan administration, the Bush one administration, the Clinton administration, and the Bush two administration, when they finally sort of backed off, it's now beginning to rear its little head again. But they, the fact that, and this is where money comes in, we're not that big of a group. We can't give a lot of lobbying money. The polyurethane foam industry, aha, they're pretty powerful. So the fact that the polyurethane foam in the furniture is essentially nothing more than solid gasoline, <laughs> right? They will not regulate that. They only want to regulate what wraps around it. So we need regulation that is reasonable and works and is commercially viable. Really, that's sort of it. And um, I, I, if you want to do something about taxes, and taxes is an issue, remember that Japan may cut its corporate tax rate, but it has a value-added tax, which we don't have here. Our disadvantage in export is when my product gets sold to France, right? I have all that American tax on it, and then my French customer has to apply the French value-added tax, which means that is, in France today, about 18%, right? That's a real tough nut. So if you're gonna cut corporate taxes, that's not really gonna help me that much ex in my exporting efforts. You gotta do something about that value-added tax. Bill Pasquale calls it the border tax. 
um, and, and do something on that end. Roger. Thank you very much.